Dr. Brown is a Regents Professor in the School of Public Policy at Georgia Tech, where she created and co-leads the Climate and Energy Policy Lab and the Master of Sustainable Energy and Environmental Management. She also co-directs the research program supporting Drawdown Georgia, which we're very grateful for. Dr. Brown's research focuses on the design and modeling of energy markets and carbon reduction policies and programs. That was what, uh, what Blair asked me to do, is to ask, to address the question, answer the question of uh, how consistent is the IRP with the um, aspirations that are, that are documented in our various assessments of what could potentially occur in terms of draw, drawing down carbon in the state of Georgia. So we started our work on um, looking at the possibilities in Georgia by creating a Sankey diagram. You know, at Georgia Tech, we like diagrams, we like numbers. But what you just should uh, hover over here is the upper left-hand number here, 52.1 to 52.1 uh, million tons of CO2 back in the year 2017 was um, the um, emissions, 52 million metric tons of CO2 was emitted from electricity generation in 2017. That number is a bit smaller now, but nonetheless, it is the second largest source of CO2 and is something maybe 37 or 38 percent of the total today. So we can't solve the greenhouse gas problem in Georgia without decarbonizing our electricity sector. Let's go to the next. Our roll up of the 20 um, high impact uh, solutions in terms of their ability to reduce emissions over the 2017 to 2030 period. Remember that we, I hope you all know about the project because we were looking at high impact solutions that targeted significant reductions by the year 2030. This was not an assessment of research uh, that might derive new technologies that could begin to play out in the you know, mid-century timeframe. We really wanted to look at what the actions in the near term, term might be. And uh, other than the carbon sinks that are shown along the top here of this diagram, uh, you begin, which are worth about uh, 48 or something, uh, CO, tons of CO, million tons of CO2, very important to the state of Georgia. But uh, the 20 solutions, one by one, are shown in the um, colorful rainbow of solutions beneath the carbon sinks. And the first one that you can see an icon sitting on is utility scale or large scale solar. If I had uh, wanted to place the others that you saw as my target for today's talk, there would be four more of them in pink, and then one of them in yellow, which is retrofitting and electric vehicles might've been on this chart as well if I had had a chance to put all those, I squeeze all those icons on. So let's go to the next slide. So that's what we assessed uh, was the possible reduction of CO2 from those six or seven um, key solutions. So how might the IRP move the needle on climate change, especially with respect to the seven solutions? I keep wavering between six and seven because I'm not gonna have a chance to talk about electric vehicles. In any event, they're not in the IRP. So we can save some time and by just, just, just erasing that topic altogether. So thank you. Here are the five um, topics, the five solutions that directly address the electricity generation uh, opportunity. Let's go to the next slide. I've piled some statistics in here. Um, again, uh, reiterating that in the 2022 IRP calls for 2100 megawatts of utility scale solar. It's by far the biggest um, opportunity in the IRP for reducing Georgia's CO2 emissions. And as Kevin mentioned, the um, 2100 megawatts are going to be subscribed to various um, uh, consumers according to the chart that's shown here in gray uh, using the 
clean and renewable energy subscription program that's modeled after the current uh, CRSP program. Um, let's keep, oh, I did want to hit the previous chart, uh, go back, yeah, the last bullet underneath that one there, it says includes an income qualified community solar pilot with 75% uh, percent discounted blocks of solar for income qualified consumers. So that's very notable. Next. So how does this compare to what we thought uh, could be delivered if the achievable um, scenario of drawdown Georgia were to be realized in, through the IRP? So um, the IRP calls for something like 4.1, uh, a solar that will amount to about 4.1 gigawatts of utility scale solar by the year 2030. Um, I'm not in, I have to qualify my statements that sometimes I'm not entirely sure the dates and numbers. It might be that this was for 2035, but they're short. You know, our goal was the, we thought that 5.4 um, gigawatts of new utility scale solar could be in place by the year 2030 compared to uh, the uh, forecast by the Department of Energy's modeling that we use of 2.6. So clearly uh, the Georgia Power Plan exceeds the Energy Information Administration's forecast, but it falls short of what we thought was achievable. Uh, what we modeled as achievable would have delivered 11.2 million tons of CO2 reduction by the year 2030. So we're gonna fall short, but still achieve a lot in the solar sphere with the IRP. Uh, next. I wanted to highlight um, with respect to rooftop solar that the, that the IRP falls way short of what we had um, estimated was possible for Georgia. It, the uh, plan calls for 200 megawatts of distributed generation. And I, I wanna show you this chart here uh, that compares how Georgia is doing with respect to solar utility scale and uh, rooftop solar um, relative to the United States. So first, in terms of renewables, uh, in 2019, Georgia had not, uh, generated 9% of its electricity from renewables, while the United States average is 18%. So we fall short on renewables, the big renewables in our um, portfolio are hydro and biomass and solar, increasingly solar. Now just look at the yellow bars and that um, amplifies the way that solar is used in Georgia versus the US. So in uh, the United States, 14.9% of its renewables are from solar. In the state of Georgia, 18.9% of our renewables are from solar. So we are solar heavy, which is great. We have the resource, other states don't. But when you compare the treatment of rooftop solar, you'll see that in the United States, 5.1% of that 14.9% is from rooftop solar. While in Georgia, 0.3% of the 18.9% uh, are from rooftop solar. So we are way behind in terms of meeting any kind of sense of what could be achieved by putting solar panels on our uh, rooftops. So let's go to the next uh, slide. All of this solar ultimately is going to cause coal to be retired. And I wanted to flag here uh, a great map of the states of Alabama and Georgia, because we need to consider both states since we do get significant um, electricity from the state of Georgia. This uses our drawdown tracker, which you can learn all about tomorrow on a webinar that will be at, starting up at three o'clock. Maybe um, Blair could put a note on that in the, in the chat. So um, you can see uh, the shearer plant, shearer coal um, plant is pointed to in the you know, little box there with a black arrow and above 
Atlanta, you see uh, Bowen above Atlanta, oh, covering Atlanta, you see McDonough, which is, is a big uh, gas plant. And uh, to the northwest of it is, uh, is Bowen. But what you don't often think about is the fact that um, to the left, um, it's okay, southeast of Birmingham in Alabama is a plant that is owned by Georgia Power and provides significant coal to us, as well as Plant Miller, which is the big brown circle um, of, again, another coal plant outside of Birmingham. Uh, we don't, to my knowledge, import from there, but just highlighting it. Okay, let's go to the next slide. Um, here is where our rooftop uh, solar uh, potential resides. Of course, it's where populations are. And to date, it has been significantly uh, moved forward in the several many large cities that have uh, solarized projects. When we assessed um, potential for Georgia, for Drawdown Georgia, we looked at what the current market might deliver, what the achievable potential is, and what's the technical potential. So the technical potential for rooftop solar is to reduce 12 million tons of uh, CO2 if every rooftop that had sun exposure were to be covered with solar. So obviously that's not viable, but um, uh, we're not with the IRP going to achieve even a small fraction of that. Okay, next chart and here is some of how we did our modeling and our assessment of uh, the um, savings that can be achieved if individuals are provided with net metering. However, net metering is not part of the IRP. The IRP does uh, not support um, the resale of excess electricity from customer sites back to the utility at retail rate. Okay, next. So uh, there are a couple of other um, solutions that besides electric vehicles that are overlooked in um, the IRP. One of them is cogeneration. Now I have to confess, I only looked at the main document and the technical, um, the technical study of options and cogeneration, otherwise sometimes known as combined heat and power, did not appear in any of, did not pop up in any of my search functions. Uh, and this is a wonderful option for Georgia. We are a highly industrialized state and uh, we produce a lot of biomass. That biomass can co-produce electricity, can uh, generate uh, excess electricity for, in the case of Albany Green, military purposes, as well as sending it back to uh, Georgia Power that buys the excess from this Albany Green biomass plant. It can provide a clean platform for integrating green uh, gas, green hydrogen, uh, renewable natural gas, and um, has an efficiency that averages between 85 and 90%, you know, 20 percent more efficient than the state-of-the-art natural gas plant. So just on efficiency grounds alone, uh, this is a winning technology, and I hope it will be uh, reconsidered. Next, we have a lot of sites where co-production uh, of electricity and heat could occur. Uh, this, these are the um, location of 41 current combined heat and power facilities in Georgia, and we estimated, so one of the ways that I remember what we estimated as our um, our carbon reduction uh, opportunities. Can everyone see our cars? We have a game, a drawdown game. Utility scale solar is the winning card. And then you have uh, retrofitting. Yes, we'll talk about that. And then cogeneration. It is number eight in terms of what it can deliver and at what price. So, you know, it's there and we don't want to overlook it. Okay, next. Um, now, landfill methane is mentioned in the IRP. So over there on the right, you can see um, the IRP promises that it will 
uh, have 480 megawatts of biomass and landfill gas uh, by the end of 2024. It currently has uh, 390. So this is you know, a very small uptick. Um, and I think, again, an under, um, uh, under emphasized opportunity. Capped landfills uh, produce methane gas through anaerobic digestion. And then it's piped in, it can, be, can create either um, renewable natural gas or it can be used to create electricity. So we go to the next slide. We've done some assessment of where um, landfill gas plants are located and what condition they're in, in terms of the biomass, the, land, the um, waste that's being delivered there, is it sufficient? And is the plant, is the landfill plant capped? And um, across Georgia, we see that publicly owned landfills often are not capped, typically are not. And most of them do not have, therefore, any kind of landfill gas collection system. So it seems like an opportunity that we should um, take advantage of an EPA agrees that there is an advantage to doing that in the state of Georgia. We have some high potential locations for um, collecting landfill gas, preventing it from going into the atmosphere and from polluting the local communities, which by the way, do tend to be uh, resource constrained. That's where you find landfills. Okay, next. Um, demand response uh, is, I'm pleased to say, uh, prioritized to some extent in the IRP. I think it could be prioritized more, but there are a number of um, programs that will be continued, such as the Residential Thermostat Demand Response Program, and there are a few new tariffs. I have not had a chance to dig deep into this demand response credit tariff or the resilience asset service tariff, but I uh, you know, like the, the sound of them and hope to get familiar with them. And, you know, this is a great way to help integrate renewables by combining um, renewables with demand response so that when you need to bridge the sunny, when the sun's down and you've got a bridge across the evening hour, a little bit of demand response could help make that happen. Next, um, yeah, here's how, here's how it works. So, you know, you've got a programmable thermostat, you've got a garage, you've got your lithium ion batteries and probably have your EV charger. Again, they're not mentioned in this I, IRP and your heat pump water heater. Uh, all of it controlled locally and at the control, in this case, in this subdivision of Georgia Power. So solar on the rooftop, all these, all these electric um, devices in these houses. And it is really a sight to be seen, the Pulte homes. Hope you get a chance to view them. We need more of those. This was a pilot, a Georgia Power pilot. Next, uh, buildings and materials. So now we're into a new section of our Drawdown Georgia solutions diverting from electricity generation to how we use electricity. And in this case, I wanted to highlight the retrofitting opportunity. It's, and Dan Matisoff led this for us. So um, the next chart shows in the IRP, um, the proposed continuation of some demand side management programs. Um, decertification of a couple, extension of some, and the certification of one new residential program, the Income Qualified Residential Investment for Savings Energy RISE pilot. So there is some expansion, but it looks very modest to me. There's one, um, I did find a interesting factoid. Um, maybe it's on the previous slide. Can you go back one, Jan? Oh, no, forward again. Maybe it's on the next slide. <laughs> How Georgia Power, let's go one more. How Georgia Power compares um, in terms of the 
savings. Okay, there it is. In 2019, at the bottom of the diagram there, of the photos, savings as a percent of sales for Georgia Power were only a half a percent compared to the average of 1% for the US. So first note that we are behind. You know, overall, we're starting from a insufficient base of support for um, energy efficiency programs. And we have some of the most inefficient buildings in the country, inefficient homes, though, and some of the biggest energy burden rates and you know, the, the um, opportunity is here to do so much more. Let's go back. I'm not sure what I missed <laughs> there. Oh, yes. I wanted to uh, show that we are doing some geospatial modeling of where we find these solutions. And in this case, we looked at where are heat pumps, because as we try to electrify more of our um, homes and buildings, and of course, transportation, um, heat pumps are going to rise to the top of our popular solutions because they offer such great efficiency and uh, cost effectiveness, but they are not operating in uh, large numbers in the state of Georgia compared to the state of Tennessee, for instance, where, as you might know, I was a regulator of TVA for eight years and we pushed heat pumps and we had a lot of heat pumps. You know, um, Kevin, you heard John Wilson talk about is Georgia power summer peaking or winter peaking? Georgia power is summer peaking because it doesn't use a lot of heat pumps in the winter. Tennessee is winter peaking because that's when everybody turns their heat pump on. And you know, we've chosen for some reason that the um, state agencies and utilities have not been pushing heat pumps and yet they are a uh, important technology going forward. So that's a big, heat pumps are not in the um, IRP. Heat pumps are not mentioned in the, uh, my scan of the IRP. Okay, next and keep on. So that, uh, that's my scan of how uh, the IRP maps onto our 20 solution high impact list. Thank you. Well, thank you, Dr. Brown. That was really helpful. You know, one of the things that kind of underpinned um, your conversation is the fact that Georgia Power is proposing to close a bunch of its coal units. And so I'm curious as you look at both their proposal and what your research how would you like to see them replace that capacity that's proposed to close? Mm -hmm. Well, one thing I'm glad about is that they are not proposing to build any new natural gas plants. Um, they are planning on uh, procuring more natural gas from existing plants, which um, is probably necessary to some extent, but I think is, is uh, potentially overdone in the IRP proposal, I would prefer to see more demand response and more energy efficiency. We saw a half a percent uh, you know, per year opportunity that we could, where we could reduce demand relative to the, what's happening in other states. I, I think that uh, we need to build a virtual power plant out of energy efficiency and demand response. That's what we did at TVA. We talked about the virtual power plants that can be built with different uh, attributes, just like a coal plant or just like a gas plant. So that's what I would hope for, more of those. Mm -hmm.